you know, Leeds came along. And How did that first come about with the idea of buying a football club? Yeah, Is that I, always a plan? No, or? no. I mean, essentially, um, you know, GFH in Bahrain um, were not trusted by the market or the regulators. And, you know, as an investor and an organisation, you constantly get documents that come onto your desk about all sorts of investments. We need this, we need this, we need this. You know, money, investments, property, whatever it may be. And people always send you documents and always deals and you look at them. And, you know, at the time, you know, you're looking at probably what, what was it, 2011, 2012, um, you know, GFH were not making a profit, serious issues with the regulators, serious issues with staff, couldn't even pay the wages of the staff at one point. Um, you know, and, you know, I saw emails saying we don't have enough money to do this, we don't have enough money to So at that stage, you, you know, this, they looked at this and I think Hisham was under pressure because he wanted to be the CEO. He was acting CEO, he wanted to be the CEO and he wanted to beat the others that were there. There was about two or three others also in line for this job. And he also wanted to try and get rid of the chairman and the founder of the company. So he, I think, was very manipulative and he looked at this deal and thought, well, this deal will get me a lot of publicity. It will get me known in the market and relatively cheap, you know, in, in the aspects it's a few million in, 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 in the big scheme of things for them, even though they were borrowing money, that's not that much. Mm -hmm. And I think with his inexperience and his naivety and his vanity, he thought that that would help him by look, going after a football club. And I remember specifically he was talking about when the Bayern International Capital went for Liverpool. Yes. All the people that were involved in that deal, which also we know didn't go ahead, yeah. were obviously some, suddenly became well known in the market. And that helped them look at other deals. And he wanted that for himself. And I think at that time, he probably didn't think it would complete. He just wanted to get known. And you know, even later on, after Leeds, he was looking at things and saying, what else can we do that will get us publicity? So it was a way of cleaning, if you like, or looking to clean some of the bad press. Because before Leeds, if you typed in GFH, you would have you know, articles from Reuters, which basically said, for want of a better phrase, they were tantamount to a Middle Eastern Ponzi scheme. You know, yeah. This one is called something like a mirage in the desert. And there were lots of extremely bad press, court cases, issues with the regulator, failed projects, failed projects, failed projects, demonstrations. That needed to be cleaned up. So from GFH's point of view, buying Leeds United was a PR exercise and a vanity project. Yep. Okay. Um, there was a lot of stories out about uh, how it was funded. Yep. Um, uh, particular articles in the Daily Mail in 2012 about possibly the Iranian government had some sort of funding towards the purchase of Leeds United. What, what can you tell us about that? I mean, I think all in all, I mean, there's, you know, there's, again, it, it's good to have this discussion. There's, there's a lot of one of the phrase gossip and comments about what, what happened. Now, essentially GFH didn't have the money. From day one, there was no money in, in, in terms of acquiring the club. Now, I didn't know all this late at that time. You know, I was promised various things by Hisham when I got involved with this, because for me, you know, being, being a Brit and being a Leeds fan, you know, and having family in England, I didn't want to get involved in something that was going to be a disaster particularly not with Leeds, you know. And so he said to me, there is money. He said to me, we have investors. You know, we have an investor in Saudi, we have this. We, all these things, you know, we'll support you, we'll do this, we'll do this. Um, and, you know, and I, I remember saying to him, look, you've got to, because this is going to be a high profile acquisition. And Hisham at the time hadn't really done any investments, full investments himself ever. So, you know, this is a naive and experienced person, charge of an organization through luck if nothing else because he had helped to oust the, 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 the founder um, not really knowing what to do not really understanding certainly football and not understanding England um, you know and not understanding the law as we now know with what happened to me later on and you know I said to him very clearly from day one you don't understand how much impact this is going to have in the media you are an Islamic bank with a bad reputation looking to come to England and buy a football club you know, that is, you know, a legendary football club and you're not experienced in football. So at the very least, you need to have money and you need to get people that know what they're doing to drive it forward. You know, so one of the first things that we did, we started talking to PR people. How can we 
ensure that what I was told was going to be a good acquisition and backed up by money and backed up by good investors is shown to everybody so they can buy into that with us as well. Um, you know, and that then comes on to the question about the money. I then later found out, now my role in the group was essentially I looked after the Dubai office and I looked after the legals. I didn't get involved in things like placement, which is what they call sales, basically. So you go and sell your investment product. That was not my role. Uh, equally, finding investments really wasn't my role. Now, things came to me because obviously as a lawyer, it does, and I'd pass them on, and I sat with the investment committee guys and things like that, but it, this wasn't my role. And then I knew there was a problem when all of a sudden, I'm being taken by the head of placement, who is the, the um, vice chairman, and I'm being taken by the chairman and the CEO and Hisham to investor meetings where they're practically begging people that they don't know and have cold called for money. And you know, this concerns me greatly. And you know, when I spoke to Hisham. How Shan, far down the line of being at Leeds United was this? This was before the acquisition. Before the before acquisition, acquisition wow. there wasn't the money. And you know, things had become public by now. And you know, I remember these investor meetings because it was embarrassing. You know, the, the right preparation wasn't made. We had some professional investors asking questions which nobody could answer. Why do you want to buy a football club? What experience have you got? Mm. How are you going to make money? What's the exit strategy? Who's this big so-called investor from Saudi which you're supposed to have? And you know, I knew that there was a problem then. Um, and you know, so I had discussions with Sharon. I said, you need to, we need to have the money for this. You know, and you need to have the money on day one. There needs to be support. You can't just do this, this, and this. And I was lied to, and I was deceived, and, and you know, so. So you you were aware of financial problems even before. Uh, you yeah, leads. I mean, I was aware of the financial problems, but I was promised that there were solutions. And you know, at the end of the day, I'd spent a lot of time with this group. So, you know, at that level, when you get those promises and you're in a private meeting, you believe them. Now, obviously, I know I don't. I mean, the same promises that I believed when I went to Dubai. You know, the real issue that I saw, and this is the, one of the things that I was going to do when I went to Dubai, and I told them I was going to do it, was some money that was used from client accounts to buy leads. Now, this has been in the media. You know, some money was taken from a company called Nico, which is um, essentially the Iranian oil company. This is a company under UN sanction. Some money was taken from Injazat Technology Fund, one of whose investors is Iran Foreign Investment Company, again, a company under sanction. This, I believe, is a breach of sanctions. Now, I was told at the time that these people had consented to that money being taken to purchase the club, like a bridging loan. Yeah. I found it odd because I knew that wasn't within what they should be doing, but it's the Middle East sometimes and things like that happen. Um, I later found out that they didn't give their consent. So, you know, if you take money from a client, from a client account, yeah. and they haven't given their consent. What's the word for that? Uh, stealing. Mm. And when that is under UN sanction, and you purchase a football club with it, I mean, put it back later, it went back later, but it was still taken, and it was still used. Now I found this out, because I'd been told that this was, they had the consent to this, and you know, I'd, I'd sent a message to, to Salah, chairman when I found, started to find out all these things, which I did when we were doing the due diligence and sport capital and things like this, you know, obviously it concerned me and they knew that I wanted to discuss that and to report that to the regulators because I was a regulated individual as well as a solicitor, I was a regulated financial individual and there were many things that, you know, I think the modern term for it is whistleblower, you know, that, that, that you find things out in a company and you need to whistleblow. This is one of the things that I was going to do. I'm stupid in that I told them that I wanted to see the regulators about certain things and I put it on a WhatsApp message, the famous WhatsApp message. And I think this message got out there somehow. That was a silly thing to do, right? And we all know what happened afterwards. Um, but the fact that money was obviously taken from client accounts and from client accounts that were subject to UN and US and uh, you know, UK and European sanctions, I think suggests the severity of the problem. You know, and that, the fact that there wasn't money was the reason why it took so long with, with, with Ken Bates to negotiate because the money wasn't there. So you would find, I was always told by Salim or Hisham, find a reason to delay the negotiations, you know, because we haven't got the money. So I'd have to argue over a stupid point of law, which we really didn't care about because we couldn't obviously go to Ken and say, Ken, we don't have the money. Because at the same time, there were other people interested that did have the money. And you know, I still at that point felt that we would get the money. I felt that the Saudi person who they were talking to would come good. You know, they were talking to the chairman of GFH, who's a billionaire, who they were trying to bring to 
leads. And we were all hopeful that that would happen. And that would have been fantastic, mm. you know, because there were good people with money and the, the, available. But I think they were put off by the inexperience, the unprofessionalism, the naivety, and for want of a better phrase, the corruption that was going on, you know. And so you, you, we got to a stage where I then didn't want this to go through. And I think everyone will see that when it did happen, when the, 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 the transaction... So you were against it going through before they bought, bought Leeds United? From the beginning, I and a no number of others said no. You know, I mean, I wasn't an official investment committee member, but I was kind of a quasi-investment, so everything went to me, because I was essentially one of the group lawyers, the group lawyer, because yeah. the, the, their lawyer left or was fired. Um, and um, so I had to sign off on a lot of these things, particularly because it came through GFH Capital. And I just said, look, no, we don't have the money. We don't have the experience, right? And this is not what we need to be doing at this time. And I say, even now I say we, because I was so used to, and this riles me a lot that I say we, so if I do it again, you have permission to punch me in the face. <laughs> David, you're saying we, it's GFH. Um, you know, they didn't have the experience, so I'd said no, you know. And even a point that Salim had said no. You know, everyone looks at Salim sometimes as being you know, this, this, you know, crazed, envious, you know, wants to be the famous one. But he had said no as well, and the, a couple of other people had said no, but Hisham wanted to do it. He just wanted to push it through. This Arab arrogance took over, and it was particularly when Preston Haskell became involved, which was the, the American that was involved in the, the, the... It became almost like a contract race. We have to do it, we have to do it, we have to do it. So yeah. ego took over, and all of a sudden, all reality and sense was put out the window. And it got to the stage where, even though I was pushing for it not to go through, it was too late, and it was obvious that it was going through, and we were all trying very hard. Um, and obviously, as you know, it went through, and at that time, I had hoped, and I know Salim had bought into this as well, we had hoped that, and I think Salim may or may not say this, probably won't because he still works there, um, we had felt, Salim and I, that Hisham had changed and now was going to put the money into the business that was required. You know, he was talking about ridiculously expensive players, ridiculously expensive managers, and he had a vision and, you know, he started to talk to people in the region that had experience of running football clubs. So there were some positive signs. And this was at the very beginning. Um, because at the very beginning, I mean, there was a, there was a lot of sort of posturing mm. and there was, a, you know, yourself and Salim was, I think it was the, after the Barnsley game, which is mm. after near Christmas, um, you sort of going around on, on the pitch and there was a lot of things happening. But of course, then uh, from the fans' point of view, it's all very, very exciting. You're seeing this at a fresh start for the club and all the fans got on board, but underneath, there's obviously yeah. still major problems well, at I that think, point. Yeah, I mean, this is where the problems were. I mean, I know at the time, Salim and I, we, and I still do, want the best for the club, you know. And as far as I was concerned, you know, I worked, as people know there, I worked ridiculously hard while I was there to try and make things better, to try and improve things, to build on, you know, what the previous owners had done and, you know, to bring new developments, new investments in. And Salim wanted that as well. Salim, we, you know, we both genuinely wanted the club to get promoted. You know, and we were constantly fighting with Bahrain about getting money, constantly, you know, and, and every single way that we could, you know. I mean, it got to a farce where we were trying to protect the players, the investments in Bahrain, you know, that we would say things like, oh, you know, Sam's injured, you can't sell him, for instance. I did that, right? You know, because there was no way I was going to let them sell Sam for a couple of hundred thousand pounds, you know. So, yeah. Both Salim and I at the time were trying our hardest to protect the club and find suitable co-investors to come alongside GFH that had the money, that had the experience, yeah. to bring that forward. You know, but that became very difficult because GFH wanted ridiculous amounts of money for their share. They had to show a profit. You know, Hisham, his first big investment, he had to show a profit. He had to show he'd done it the right way. And you know, nobody was interested because the prices were ridiculous. He couldn't find anyone. And when someone did come in, the comedy of the naivety and unprofessionalism of those involved at GFH in the discussions just made people run a mile. You know, I mean, I saw it so many times. We talked to GFH, not we, he didn't punch me. <laughs> <laughs> GFH talked to so many people about, you know, but, and I remember the meetings, they were just in shock at the stupidity of everybody. Mm. Um, and that puts people off, you, you know, and, you know, all the main suspects that you see who've been interested and the media have talked about they probably did have meetings and they probably were involved or they came to Dubai and I sat in on some of them, but they were just flummoxed by what was going on. Um, you know, and that's was kind it, of... Was it Hisham's thought, do you think, even before buying, that he bought Leeds United to flip it on? It was just an investment, let's flip it on. Was there any 
what, I mean, you say there the was thing a, with his uh, show. he was talking to a lot of these big managers and everything, but at the back of his mind, mm. he's an investment banker. Uh, is he then just looking to flip this over? Oh, I might have changed the, the B and the banker with a W, but um, uh, <laughs> uh, no, anyway. Um, so, you know, I think at the time, you've got to remember, Hisham had not really had a, a, a very professional background. He'd come from some IT company. He's worked his way up. He got the job because he's a local who his wife's um, you, you know, father is, who's involved in the Central Bank of Bahrain. Um, he didn't really know what he was doing basically, and he was trying to rely on all these people which were telling him all different things because it was like a little fight and everybody wanted their own piece. So he didn't really know what he was doing, he was just pushing it through because he needed to do something, otherwise he was not going to get the top job. Um, so I just think it was complete inexperience, you know, he really hadn't a clue and I think at the beginning what he intended was to get the deal, to bring in a big investor alongside GFH, GFH would keep a stake, to bring in, and, and he would manage that for the big investor. And that's kind of what they do with all their other properties or their other investments or whatever it may be. Find something that's great. Um, bring in investors that take 90, 80% of it. They take a little bit, which ultimately they get for free, and they run that investment for the, the, the investment. A typical private equity. Yeah. And I think that was what he had intended to do. And I think probably at the time he had talked to somebody that was interested. But I think the fact that he hadn't really done very many deals, and obviously as a lawyer, been a lawyer for a while then, I'd done countless private equity deals, you, you know, and Salim similarly, um, you know, but I think things changed when he realised it was quite hard to sell that. I think his naivety brought him to the fact that, oh, it'd be easy, easy to sell them to investors, but of course it's not. Yeah. Football clubs generally don't make money, and, you know, it's a difficult sell in the Middle East, a football club that doesn't make, that money. Doesn't make money, or that is making a small amount, that wasn't in the Premier League, you know, it, all, it should be in the Premier League, we all know that. Yeah. But it, it's not at the moment. And it, it's, it's a difficult sell. And particularly to the people in the Middle East who look at egos and pride and things like that. And um, then I think the strategy changed, it was get rid of it no matter what. Constantly changing, one week it would be, we're keeping it, build it. We're keeping it full stop, build it, have some money, here's some investment. The next week, something's happened. He's, I don't know, had an argument with the regulator, had an argument with his wife, whatever it may be. Yeah. And this and was, I think, one of the most embarrassing situations